This is a short video about Dumov's theorem and its extension. So here's the setup. Say you've got a complex number z and you've written it in polar coordinates as r times e to the i phi. And let's take n for right now just to be a natural number. So my natural numbers start from 1, 2, 3, etc. Then what happens when we raise z to the nth power? So z to the n, if I think about exponent rules, that should be, well, r e to the i phi all to the n. And again, continuing with what do I know about exponents, I can just raise each of those pieces, r and i phi to the nth power. And now I'll switch back, because I know a different way to write i, oh, sorry, e to the i n phi. Remember, e to the i n phi is cosine of n phi plus i sine of n phi. And so again, I'm thinking about n phi is like the argument uh, of, of this complex number now. So that's what happens with it, with that n. So anyway, what was, the, what was the idea? How do we raise z to a nice nth power where n is some natural number? Then all we need to do is raise the absolute value to that power and then multiply the argument by that power. And so to put that all together just one more time, if z has polar form r times cosine of phi plus i sine of phi, and if n's a natural number, then z to the n should be r to the n times cosine of n phi plus i sine of n phi. And to give you a little picture, right, um, you can think about where if n uh, is a natural number and if, say, the absolute value is bigger than 1, then, you know, the, the nth power is going to be stretching the radius of the circle somehow. And, of course, it works the opposite way. If uh, the radius is smaller than 1, then the nth power should be a smaller circle or a circle of smaller radius is what I mean. So let's look at an example. So how do we use Dumov's theorem in order to uh, compute a power of a complex number? And again, a nice power of a complex number, like a ninth power. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to label the base 1 minus root 3i. I'm going to label that as z. And we should put z in polar coordinates. And so when I do that, you know, I find the absolute value. Remember, another word for that is modulus. Or right, think of it as the length, if you like to think of complex numbers as a vector. Anyway take the absolute value, and so that would be 1 plus, really that should be negative square root of 3 in there, quantity squared. doesn't really matter though since you're squaring it. And uh, so you get 1 plus 3 under that radical, and of course you get 2. Now you need to find what is the argument of z. So what is that, uh, what's that angle that corresponds to z? And we know the relationship that's a tangent of phi should be you know, y over x if you like. In my case, root 3, negative root 3 over 1. And so I want to know, you know, what angle uh, gives me a tangent, a tangent of one angle gives me negative square root of three. And there's a couple answers to that question. We're going to take phi to be negative pi over three. And so to give you a picture here, I know that there's actually two answers to that question, especially if you use your calculator to figure out, you know, arc tangent of negative root three, or uh, another word for that is inverse tangent of negative square root of three. Um, anyway, this is where you need to, to realize that, look, your complex number z, 1 minus root 3i, is down here in the, in the fourth quadrant down here. And so that's how I know that I want to take minus pi over 3 to be my angle. So you're going to get two angles that maybe differ by a multiple of pi. Okay, so so far, to put z, remember the base, in the polar form, we just figured out that that should be 2 times cosine of minus pi over 3 plus i sine of minus pi over 3. And maybe you've seen some properties of like cosine is even, so you don't really need this minus inside. And maybe you remember that sine is odd, so this minus can technically come out here. Um, but anyway, I'm going to leave it unsimplified like this, because what do I want to do? Here's z. I want to take z to the ninth. And now is where I can use Dumov's theorem. So I know that z to the ninth power should be, well, the radius 2 to the ninth. Really, I mean absolute value there. So 2 to the ninth times, and then I just take that 9, and again, I just multiply the argument by that 9. And so at the end, I get my answer is 2 to the ninth is 512, and then cosine of minus 3 pi plus i sine of minus 3 pi. And then, uh, let's see, if you put that into, com into, um, sorry, into rectangular form, that's 512, cosine of minus 3 pi is negative 1, plus I'm just writing 0i for emphasis. So you get this complex number minus 512 plus 0i. Of course, you could just think of that as negative 512. I wrote it as plus 0i just so that, you know, we're plotting this in the complex plane. And so these are just two points that are on the real axis, you know, if you like the x-axis. So z to the ninth is way over there to the left. So Dumov's theorem will also work for uh, negative uh, integers as well. And it works the exact same way. But there's a more complicated question we need to answer. What happens if I want to take, you know, fractional powers of a complex number, like a square root, say, or a three-fourths power? 
And so let's talk through how should this work because we're gonna say it's a little bit more tricky. So we need to look at some of the details. Um, so if Z has polar form R times cosine of phi plus I sine of phi, I wanna know what is Z to the one over N power where N for our intents and purposes is make it a natural number. So think, what if, how do I take a square root, one half power if you like. All right, so I want whatever Z to the one over N is, what do I want it to be? I want it to be a complex number that satisfies the following. When you take Z to the one over N to the nth power, that ought to give you back Z. All right, so I want the one, whatever, whatever that complex number is, I want it, when I take it to the nth power, it should give me back Z. And so let's run with that. So Z to the one over N theoretically has some polar form. I'll use the Greek letter rho for its radius, or if you like, its absolute value. And then I'll use the Greek letter theta for its argument. So let's theoretically, Z to the one over N has this polar form. And uh, let's take that now to the nth power. So if I take both sides to the nth power, here is where in the next step, you know, I can just take each of these pieces to the nth power. But in the next step, we're gonna use Dumov's theorem in order to simplify, again, this part right here. If you see some textbooks or videos, sometimes people just refer to using the rule here that I know that when I take cosine of theta plus I sine of theta to the nth power, that that N really just gets multiplied inside the argument here. Some people just call that Dumov's theorem. Um, I'm just using Dumov's theorem as a catch-all for all these wonderful results about how to take powers of complex numbers. So I get uh, Z here should be rho to the nth power and then cosine of N theta plus I sine of N theta. And now let's compare. Because if you remember above, I wrote it in green, uh, Z has polar form R cosine of phi plus I sine of phi. And what we would like is, you know, the polar form of Z to the one over N, it ought to be related to Z somehow, right? So in other words, whatever the radius or modulus, whatever word you like there, whatever modulus Z to the one over N has ought to be related to R some way. And whatever the argument of Z to the one over N is, it's angle theta, right? That ought to be related to phi, the argument of Z in some way. And so down here is an equation that can help me figure out how are these things related? How is R related to phi to the n? I'm sorry, how is R related to rho to the n? And then also how is phi related to n theta? So let's start off with the, with, with the radius here, the absolute values. Again, I keep using all these words interchangeably on you. So by the end of all these videos, you're just gonna be okay with all these different ways to describe what that number out front is. So let's take the absolute value of both sides. And if you do that, you know, if you're thinking, Oof, I missed that there. Absolute value of both sides here, and I'm, and I'm thinking that, okay, that's really absolute value of that times that, absolute value of that times these guys here. And so here's where I see that, well, that would just be one in each of these cases. And then, so I really see that, that R should be equal to rho to the N. And so I went through a lot of trouble there just to get to this part here. And now what we can do is if I wanna know what rho is and how rho depends on R, let's just take the N through to both sides. So maybe intuitively, rho, remember that is the absolute value of z to the one over n, you should just take the one over n power of, of the absolute value of z. So that's the intuitive part. And now let's get to, uh, oops, and here's, here's this picture as well. So, you know, when I take an nth root, uh, in this case, again, assuming that maybe r is a number that is bigger than one, when I take an nth root, uh, it's gonna be something that's smaller than it here. Uh, so my picture kind of works out. How do phi and n theta relate? So we just figured out how r and rho to the n relate. Now I wanna look at how the arguments of these two complex numbers relate. And here's the thing, it has to be the same complex number, right? So these are two expressions that yield the same complex number. And so that means that these angles, you know, you're thinking about, thinking about them as rotating around in a circle in some way, you've gotta land in the same spot. And so what that tells me is, is that they can only differ by a multiple of two pi. So some integer multiple of two pi is how n and phi can differ. And what we're gonna do, I'm sorry, how n theta and phi can differ. And so now what we're gonna do is we're going to just solve this thing for theta. And what I'd like to know is how does theta, which is the argument of z to the one over n, how does it depend on phi, just the argument of z? And uh, what we see then, when you get theta by itself, you divide everything by n, I see that theta should be phi over n plus two k pi divided by n. And here is the extension of Dumov's theorem, by the way, where k is an integer. So what I mean by the extension of Dumov's theorem, I just mean, what do we do when we wanna take a fractional power of our complex number? And so if we collect our results here, 
If z has polar form r cosine of phi plus i sine of phi, where again, n's a natural number, uh, if I wanna take the one over n power of z, in other words, the nth root of z, I just need to take the nth root of the modulus of z, and then here's the trickier part, the argument becomes phi over n plus 2k pi over n, in each case here, where, what should k be? And k should be a number that's between zero and n minus one. And if you think about it, like when k equals n, then I just kind of wrap back around. And so then I would just get phi over n plus two pi in that case. So, so these are kind of the, the, dis, the k's that give you distinct complex numbers. So what am I saying to you here? Uh, above, you know, when I took an nth power, you know, I just got one number back. But here, when I take a one over n power, now there's multiple values that I could get here. And so there's n values of k. In other words, there should be there should be what? n nth roots of a complex number. And so why should that make sense? If you think about college algebra, which again, I'm sure you've all had if you're watching this video on complex variables or complex analysis, I know that any polynomial over the complex numbers, and so in, in particular, this polynomial, z to the n equals a plus bi, thinking of z as a variable, you know, a complex, uh, I'm sorry, a polynomial of degree n has to have exactly n roots, uh, n complex roots. And so that's exactly what we're saying here. So let's do a little example where we use this extension of the Moivre's theorem in order to talk about what are fractional powers of complex numbers. So I'm gonna solve this equation w to the fourth is one minus root three i. And I'm using the same z above, one minus root three i that we took to the ninth power in a previous example. So what do I wanna do? I wanna know what w is. And so, well, w ought to be the fourth root of one minus root three i. And so the first thing that we'll do to use De Moivre's theorem to do this stuff, it's, it's easier to work with polar coordinates instead of this rectangular form, one minus root three i. Let's put z in polar coordinates. And uh, when I put it in polar form, we did all that hard work in the example when we raised it to the ninth power. You should recall that the polar form of one minus root three i is two times cosine of minus pi over three plus i sine of minus pi over three. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna raise this to the one fourth power, take the fourth root of it, whatever you like to say. And now by the extension of De Moivre's theorem, this should just be, well, two to the one fourth power, right? So when I do that there, and then uh, I need to take the argument minus pi over three, and I'm going to divide it by that four and then add two K pi over four. And remember, what are the Ks I need to keep track of? I need to use all the Ks from zero to N minus one, if you remember up here in the statement of the theorem. And uh, of course, that would be from zero to three. But so when you're counting, we see that, okay, I'm gonna get four complex numbers out of this. So when you take a fourth root, you should have four corresponding complex numbers. And let's look at what they should be. And how should you find them? You should just take a turn for each value of k. So when k is zero, go ahead and plug zero in for k uh, into your expression for in general what the fourth roots look like. And so I put a zero here and I put a zero here where that k is. And uh, all we get there is two to the one fourth cosine of minus pi over 12 plus I sine of minus pi over 12. And then now we should do when K equals one, I'm not even gonna bother simplifying these very much. Like who knows what that fraction is. I don't have a calculator nearby and you expect me to do common denominators in my head. Anyway, just kidding. I'm gonna leave these unsimplified though. So this is what the complex number you get when K equals one. This is the complex number you get when K equals two. And then lastly, the complex number you get when K equals three. And then now, uh, a little bit below, I went ahead and I plotted these. Uh, I just used Desmos to do that. And I tried to make it so that they correspond to the particular colors. So like Z was green, uh, when K equals zero, that's red, K equals one, that's blue, et cetera. And I'll zoom in a little bit in case you also like to use Desmos, but maybe you're a little bit confused how you might use it to plot these complex numbers. You should have a little option to change from a, a, a rectangular grid to a polar grid as I've done. But uh, all I've done otherwise is I've plotted, you know, the circle of radius two that Z lived on. And then I also plotted the circle of radius uh, fourth root of two. And so that's the inner dotted black circle there. And then you see uh, just how I went about, I used uh, just plotting it as a point X comma Y in order to get these points that are, you know, green, red, blue, and et cetera. But uh, what you see, what something that I didn't write down explicitly anywhere else is that, you know, these things, they form a perfect n-gon. So in my case, they 
form like a perfect square inside of these that's inscribed inside of that circle. And that's actually always gonna be the case. I think maybe instead of perfect, what I mean is a regular n-gon, right? Uh, and so that'll always be the case that your complex roots will lie, complex nth roots will lie, uh, will form a regular n-gon inside of that circle of radius, you know, r to the one over n. So that's a really neat, neat thing that's visually appealing about plotting these nth roots of complex numbers.